Due diligence is the nothing personal word of the day. It's Friday, August 26th, 2022. Friday always means the start of a weekend, which is great for everybody, unless you are in the Buffalo Bills front office and you are faced with a story where your rookie punter, Matt Ariza, has been accused of gang raping a 17-year-old while he was in college, while he was over 18, which of course would also be statutory rape. There's no reason to get into the details of exactly what happened, but I want to explain to you why the NFL and why the Buffalo Bills are in a situation of their own making and how do they get out of it. A couple of details first for you to wrap your arms around what's real and what's not real. When a player is in college, no matter what that player does, it doesn't matter from murder to rape to gambling to steroids to anything. The Major League Baseball, Major League Baseball, or the National Football League, they have no right to discipline any player for any action that takes place prior to that player being in the union, prior to that player being drafted and being on the roster of a member franchise. So let's make sure we have that fact. However, there are systems in place that all teams should have when you are drafting a player. NFL, MLB, does not matter, NBA. We do not just background checks, we do security checks. We speak to family members, we speak to friends, we speak to professors, we speak to coaches. When we are signing a player, whether they are in the first round, the sixth round, like Matt Ariza, or the 20th round, we do a level of due diligence. It is not equal. The quiet part out loud is that I am much less concerned doing due diligence for a player who gets a $5,000 bonus or gets a contract for $20,000 or is a late round draft pick or someone who is on the special teams drafted in the sixth round of the NFL. It is not impossible to believe that the level of due diligence done in that case is less than your first round pick who is going to be the face of your franchise, who's going to have the press conference. Have you ever seen a press conference for a six rounder? We do a press conference for a first rounder. First rounders get millions of dollars. Low round picks get hundreds of thousands to tens of thousands of dollars. So we like to tell our baseball people that we want you to do the same level of due diligence for any level of the draft. They don't do it. We know they don't do it. We don't enforce it. They know we're not gonna enforce it. Therefore, it's not done. Why? Because if I would ever find out that something nefarious went on with a player that was drafted in the 10th round, 9th round, 14th round, it's very simple, release. If I find out that a first rounder did something, it's called fire. If I have a first round pick who the research was not done properly and I'm not aware that he's a drug addict, I'm not aware that he's got legal issues, I'm not aware that he's got any sort of physical or mental problem that will stop him from performing at the highest level to help our team win, that is the responsibility of the scouts and of the baseball department in football of your football operations department. The sixth round where Matt Ariza was drafted is very interesting, sort of in the middle. You want your sixth round pick to perform. You're not totally despondent if he doesn't perform. But then the phone call comes in where you are made aware of an allegation that one of your young players has done something bad. I've gotten that email, I've gotten that text, I've gotten that phone call. Sometimes for minor league players I had never heard of that were in my own organization. Yes, there were minor league players who I didn't know their name. It happens, there's a ton of players. Six round draft pick, I'd know that day. I'd get a list of players to follow each season in the minor leagues. Maybe he's on that list, maybe he's not. In football, I would argue if I were running a football team, I would know the name of my six round draft pick. The Buffalo Bills, the Biffalo Buffs get a phone call. Dear Sean, are you aware that your sixth round draft pick, your current punter, is being sued right now civilly for a situation that happened in college? 
Hmm. What do you do? First thing you do is you call your GM, then you call your owner, and you speak to the agent. You don't call the player first, you call the agent first. And you ask, what's going on here? Did you know this? What's the story? Are you settling? Did it actually happen? The NFL gets its security department, the Department of Investigations and MLB is what it's called, and they go and they try to see what they can glean from the authorities, from the courts, from the lawyers. Yes, they all have connections to learn things they probably shouldn't know. <gasps> Spoiler alert, yes, sports leagues are very powerful. But when you get a call and you've got a positional player in football and you get a call that there is a issue with that player, what would be the reason that two weeks later you cut his only competition and give him the starting job? I'm just wondering. The Buffalo Bills cut three days ago a punter who incidentally has signed with the Colts since then and made Ariza their starting punter after they had gotten word that he was involved in a civil litigation involving statutory rape. So maybe they went up to him and said, hey, Matt, did you do this? Oh, of course not. I don't even know. I wasn't even at San Diego State. Well, you were. We drafted you from there. I wasn't even at that party. Well, that was the party that we know. There's pictures. Yeah, but I wasn't in the room. Well, you were in the room. Yeah, but I didn't touch her. Right? Think about what a person says to try to make sure that they have their career. Think about how hard it is for anyone to come forward with any sort of allegation against an athlete. Hello, we've talked about this with the quarterback for the Cleveland Browns. No oxygen for you, DW. There is only one way that this should end. It cannot end with discipline by the NFL. They have absolutely no authority to discipline either Matt Ariza or the Buffalo Bills. The Buffalo Bills have no ability to discipline Matt Ariza. None. But guess what they can do? They can release him. When you're running an organization, there are certain third rail issues. Obviously, we know the NFL doesn't view domestic violence as a third rail issue. The NFL, we know, does not view sexual assault as a third rail issue. What say they about statutory rape? Hmm, we're gonna find out, aren't we? Roger Goodell, whose people may be watching right now. When someone comes knocking on your door from your legal department and says, hey, do we wanna call Buffalo? Do we wanna suggest anything? Nah, let's let them decide what to do. No, when you run a league, it's your face in front. You are the front facing public I, public face of the National Football League. You make $50 million a year because you need to call the team who may not want to do the right thing, who may have winning above all. And you say no more black eyes in our league. It's a punter, with all due respect to Pat. Of course, there are amazing Hall of Fame great punters. Hey, Ray, I'm talking about you. By the way, not a surprise, Matt Ariza won the Ray Guy Award last year. Ironic, right? You call up Buffalo and you say he will not wear a uniform ever professionally. Now, all the people out there who say, well, what if he's innocent? What if he didn't do it? Great. Keep your leg warm. Get rid of the civil litigation. Get a release that it was all made up and then we'll bring you back. Before then, you will not represent the city of Buffalo. Right now, the Buffalo Bills are trying to get public financing to build a new stadium. They have gotten almost all the way there. They're getting over a billion dollars from people all over the state. Is it not the responsibility of the team? Forget whether they're fleecing taxpayers. Is it not the responsibility of the team to do the right thing when it comes to any sort of physical abuse and violence? Or is it always about the W? We'll see what Buffalo does and that will answer your question. All right, Coca, play me some music. You know what I want? <laughs> I want to talk to Samson. Well, you got me at David P. Sampson on Twitter. Hello, David. Hello. 
Bryce Harper has performed well in his rehab, and now he will be back with the Phillies tomorrow, which is today because I got this yesterday. So he said tomorrow, but it's today. Did you ever change rehab timelines because of performance? I love your question. Thank you for asking. I appreciate the engagement on Twitter. Bryce Harper on June 25th was standing in the box. Blake Snell, the fantastic, amazing pitcher for the San Diego Padres with the four and a half ERA who goes five innings, hit him on the thumb, fractured his thumb, out, surgery. The general timeline for that, if you are really lucky, is eight weeks. No matter what the team announces, fractured thumb surgery, rule of thumb, eight weeks. Eight weeks from June 25th, we're right there. It's the time. There are guys who are out 12 weeks. Sometimes it stiffens up. Sometimes they don't actually do the physical therapy required. All sorts of things can happen. You can have scarring that goes wrong. For all, listen, I'm not practicing medicine without a license here. I'm just telling you from my experience with baseball injuries, this is what happens. And if you've ever tried to swing a bat, thumbs, it turns out, are important for a whole lot of things. So fracturing your thumb is a problem. So the plan that we do with a player when they are hurt, you are allowed a certain number of days on rehab assignment. Rehab assignment is when you get to go to a minor league team, you get to face kids who are way worse than you are, no matter what level you are when you're hurt, whether you're Bryce Harper or the 26th man, you in theory, because you're at the big league level are better than these minor leaguers. You talk to the player and the agent about where you are gonna send the player on rehab. Some players want to stay close to home. Some players want to stay close to where the team plays. So we have a team in Jupiter, which is a single A team. Some of the players wanted to be in Jupiter so they could still live in their place and commute from Miami. It's our decision, but we work with the player. Bryce Harper goes out on rehab. Prior to your first day of rehab, we have laid out in writing what your rehab plan is. We want you to get 14 at-bats. You are gonna hit first in the lineup and we are gonna keep you there. You're gonna play four innings the first day, six innings the second day, three days of nine innings. You're gonna get two at-bats the first day, two the second, three, then four, then four, and then maybe five if the game goes that long. But we're gonna hit you first. I don't know where Bryce Harper hits your rehab, but we would talk about where the player would hit in the lineup. Then you call your minor league affiliate, you call your minor league manager, and you say, Bryce Harper's coming. Here's where he's hitting, here's where he's playing in the field. Then you call the owner of the minor league team when you're getting a star player on rehab, and you let that owner and that GM of that team, those are not employees of the major league team, unless the major league team owns the minor league team, but that's a different story. But assuming it's independently owned, the nice thing to do is to call the owner and the GM to say, hey, you're about to get Bryce Harper. Raise the price of your tickets, do some promotions, because you're about to get a lot of media and there's gonna be sellouts. So there's a bunch of stuff that you do when Bryce Harper goes out. And then after a game, I would get a report. The head of player development would call the GM. The GM would come see me and say, Harper, now if it's a player like Harper, I'm getting an at-bat by at-bat update. But let's just say that at the end of the game, you get a game report in writing what Bryce Harper did, what were the plays? What were the pitch counts? What did he swing at? Was he swinging at breaking balls? Was he wincing? So we'll get a written report from the coaching staff of the minor league affiliate so we can learn, did it look like he was laboring? Sometimes we would even send a major league scout or even an assistant GM to watch a rehab of your star player so we could see for ourselves. But most times you take the word of your development coaches. So I would get a report Game one, here's what happened. Here's how he looks. All right, game two. Meanwhile, I got the owner in my ear saying, get him back. Get him back right now. You don't need to build up his arm. If you're a pitcher, let him pitch three innings. I'd rather him pitch three innings at the big league level than three innings at the minor league level. What? That's Of course, I get that, but that is not smart for the player. No matter what a player tells you, their focus, their, phys- their level of physical exertion is different when they're playing a minor league rehab game versus when they're in a major league game. They press way more at the major league level. They're trying to throw 98, 99, 100, 101, even if they can't. They're trying to swing 
hard to get hits, home runs, even if they shouldn't be. At the minor league level, you get a truer view of the status of your player. So Harper goes in and he crushes. A home run, two for two, two walks, then he goes three for five, two hits, a walk off, whatever he does. If we get a report that a player is hitting the ball well, that does not make us change our timeline. What does make us change our timeline, are we in the race? How badly do we need him back? And how does he look? We do not base it on results of the at-bat. As a matter of fact, there are very few things in the game other than some bench position competitions in spring training. You really don't base it on performance. Sounds crazy, doesn't it? But do you think Bryce Harper needs to hit well in spring training to earn a spot on the team? Or Zach Wheeler? Just pick a player who you know is a major leaguer. You're not looking at their stats during spring training at all. You're looking to make sure they're in shape and prepared and ready to go nine innings come opening day. So when a good major league player is on rehab, performance does not matter. Results do not matter. All of the other ancillary things that we're looking for do. So the Phillies, when they changed his timeline and brought him up to play in tonight's game, Everyone is writing it's because of how well he's hit, but don't be fooled. You now know the reason they moved up the timeline is because he felt ready, looked ready, and is ready, and now it's time for him to come back as the Phillies are involved in this wild card chase. So have I ever changed the rehab timeline because of performance? No. Thanks for the question. You know, it's the Phillies and the Yankees have two things that are similar, by the way, going on right now. This was always frustrating for me in all the years. When you have an injury list, right? Every day I would get the injury report emailed to me. The injury report is what the trainer fills out. And a lot of it is copy paste, but they have to switch like day two on the IL. The next day you get it, it's day three on the IL. Status, no throw. Status, no swing. Status, no run. Torn hamstring, no run. Tommy John surgery, day 169 on the IL. Status, throwing at 30 feet, picking up a ball. You get a written report of every player on your injured list, whether it's the 15-day or the 60-day or the concussion list or the COVID list. You are getting the report in detail. So I would always look at those reports and I do calculations about when certain players are coming back, when I can expect them, always being the optimist when the trainer says this is gonna be four to six weeks. I'm like, it's gonna be 3.9 weeks, man. It's gonna be 27 days. So I'm keeping track of all this. And when I know that a player's coming back like Bryce Harper, I'm thinking we, we hung in there. Man, we were like 31 and 20 or 32 and 20 without Bryce. We're in the wild card all of a sudden. We fired Girardi, so everything's great in the world. We can't catch Philly. Uh, we can't catch Atlanta. Four, six, nine. Sorry, Coco. Ready? Two, 69, 80. We can't catch Atlanta. We can't catch the Mets, but we are right there. We can get Rob Thompson, the manager of the year. We need Bryce Harper back. Let's go. Let's roll into September. Knock on the door, phone rings, come in, what, what? No, no, yeah, well, Bryce is good, how is Bryce? I'm not coming to you talk about Bryce. Well, what do you mean, what happened? Zach Wheeler has forearm inflammation. No, no, that happened so many times. We would sit around in an office and we would discuss player moves, projecting, We've got a player coming off the injured list in seven days. We're going to have to make a roster move. Here's what we're looking to do. We could take a bullpen pitcher away and have an extra bat. We could take a bat, send him down. We look at how many options a player has. We look at the business. We look at the salary. We look at service time. We look at performance. We look at where the team is, and we make a decision. We're all ready, and at least 70% of the time, and this is what's crazy about baseball when people say, oh my God, your job is so hard. 70% of the time, the decision is made for us. 
What I mean by that is when we're choosing between two bullpen arms at any point in the season and we've got to make a decision by X day, on X minus one day something happens where someone gets hurt or someone is gone and there was bad performance or something else happened and the decision gets made for you. Zach Wheeler was sent to the injured list. Forearm inflammation. Remember he signed that five-year $118 million deal? He's got still two years left like $47 million left. Do you know what forearm inflammation means? Just so you know, if you're watching this on YouTube, nothing personal with David Sampson, forearm, right? Look at your arm. I'm looking at my arm, forearm, inflammation. That means there's something going on either north or south. And with pitchers, it's generally south. That's elbow. What do you do with forearm inflammation? The injury list will say this, Zach Wheeler, 15 day IL, forearm inflammation, anti-inflammatory given day one. We give him drugs. I forgot what the, uh, it's a pack of steroids we give, not the performance enhancing steroids. I wanna say pregnizone or prozone or I can't believe I'm blanking coca. What's the, um, I have to call someone now. I'm not going to stop the show and do it, but we would give them, and it's something and we have to tell them to eat because it's bad for your stomach, but we just say, coat your stomach, take this. We got to get the inflammation down. It's like Advil on steroids. I can't think of the name of it. But in any case, that's what you'd see on the injury report. Here's the problem with forearm inflammation when you are a pitcher, and it is August 26th. The minute you see that, that's a month. Boom, just like that. There is nothing more frustrating than when you don't have health and you have a team that's been performing and you have to say next man up. And you know that your rotation is not deep enough and that now every five days, instead of Zach Wheeler, your number one or number two starter, prednisone, that's it. Prednisone, day one. Prednisone pack, good. Coco, are you on that? Where did you come up with that? That's the, that's the anti-inflammatory. And there's one that was uh, back in the early 2000s that we'd use. I'll go back and ask the team doctor. And then we were not allowed to use it anymore all around baseball because it was doing such damage. It was causing like liver damage and cancer. So it's a certain, um, it's a certain anti-inflammatory that we were giving out like Tic Tacs and now we can't use. And I'm blanking on the name. You know, this is live. I don't have the name. Anyway. Are I worried about liver damage or stomach aches? No, should I have been? Probably yes, but I wasn't. Zach Wheeler is not gonna be back this season. I'll give you, you know what? That's a wait to see, Coca. Wait to see is when we tell you something's gonna happen and sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. I've got an official wait to see. First, Zach Wheeler will not be back this season. Bad, bad break for the Phillies. Second, just cut this however you want to, Coca, but I, I want to get this as a wait to see, and it should have been in the first segment, and I didn't have it in my mind, and I should have. Remember the segment that you may have listened to on Matt Ariza, the punter? The Bills are going to release him. Wait to see. He will not be punting in the regular season. So the whole story of injuries and a player coming back and a player leaving, when I tell you it's something that's a disaster and that hurts when you're a front office person, I'm telling you that's a truth. Not only did it happen to the Phillies, it just happened to the Yankees. The Yankees crushed the Oakland A's last night, of course, not that there was a surprise. And they got Giancarlo Stanton back, which was amazing. He already drove in runs. He was good to have him in the lineup. It changes the whole lineup. I'm looking to see right now what the attendance was in Oakland to see whether or not they actually drew people with the Yankees in town. I'm going to guess that they may have gotten to 10,000. Yep, 10,876. I'm funny, right? They have a season ticket base of probably 1,500 at most. And when the Yankees come, you get some advanced tickets because you know in advance the Yankees are coming your day of game seats go up a little bit then you find out Stanton's back so you get another couple hundred people to come and then bing bang boom you're not going to announce 2800 or 4200 you announce just over 10,000 well done Oakland 10,000 people watching the Yankees I assume that's the smallest crowd they played in front of this year Stanton comes back and good old Nestor Cortez goes to the DL with an injury I think it's a groin injury so there's a couple of things that are being said by people out there about this that I want to address vis-a-vis the Yankees. That Nestor Cortez was on an innings limit and that they were going to have an issue 
as they headed into October. So this injury is well-timed. There is no injury that is well-timed. When we wanted to shut down a player, we would put him on the DL with a far more phantom injury than groin. Groin's pretty good, but we would use back or, or arm fatigue. I didn't like using groin because that normally comes with a limp and I wouldn't want someone to get a picture of my player for getting to limp. We would go to the player and say, hey, we're gonna put you on the IL right now. We're gonna have the roster spot. We're gonna shut you down, but we're gonna have you pitch every five days down in the minor leagues, down at our spring training site. Your arm is gonna keep being stretched out, but it won't be during major league games where where you're not throwing from 60 or 120 feet. You're on the mound throwing all of your pitches because we're missing three times through the rotation. We're limiting your innings, and then you're gonna come back and be ready to step right in. If Nestor Cortez has an actual groin injury, you have to wait. And the reason why groin injuries are tough, it's the same as hamstring injuries, as knee injuries. You don't want pitchers to have leg problems because when they have a leg problem, it actually leads to an arm problem. Arm problems are way more severe, way more troubling because they could impact careers. Legs just have to be rested because you don't want your pitcher to change his mechanics because he's trying to compensate for something that hurts. And for those of you who have ever pulled a groin, you know the impact it has where sometimes you take a step or you do a quick jerking motion. By the way, pun not intended, correlation not intended. Thank you. And you have that pain that shoots all the way up and down your leg. Yeah, if you're feeling that while pitching, you're gonna pitch however you have to pitch to not feel that way. And that's putting different extra pressure on your arm. So if the Yankees tried to outsmart us by saying groin injury when this was just a matter of shutting him down, then that was a mistake. If he actually does have a groin injury, then you are looking at a minimum of two weeks and the Yankees are gonna be very careful with him because they definitely don't want him hurt. But another example of a team, one up, one down. God, is that frustrating. All right, when we come back, we are going to review a movie and then talk about another thing that happened in the NFL that uh, interested me greatly, and I think you will find it to be a pretty compelling story. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Nothing Personal. My name is David Sampson. Thank you for joining us this week. It's been a week, right? Guys had three hours of me yesterday, the day before, down in Florida. I actually made it back without any delays, Coca, which was pretty good. I got to watch Man from Toronto with Kevin Hart and Woody Harrelson, Ellen Barkin's in it. Netflix continues to make movies that make me smile. They get all these stars, pay all this money. Ryan Reynolds, Ryan Gosling, Kevin Hart. I'm watching. Woody Harrelson, who made his 469th movie. Kevin Hart plays a character, wrong place, wrong time, goes to the wrong Airbnb, right? What's your nightmare with an Airbnb? We reviewed a movie, Coca, uh, that was with a a couple, four people who went to an Airbnb and were stalked and there were cameras on them. I don't remember the name and I have not been to an Airbnb since. And uh, they're not a sponsor, so I can say that. But this movie, he goes to an Airbnb and he has the wrong address because like in Minority Report, the number was turned upside down or whatever the reason is. And it turns out to be where there's a torture going on between an assassin and a subject. And it's mixed identity. It's, it's so formulaic and so bad that I just wanna get a quick thank you. Just a quick thank you for saving you from watching that movie. Now, granted, it's been out for a while, so I may not have saved you, but do you really disagree with my review? Now, it's pretty cool, Man from Toronto, because there's other characters in the movie, Man from Miami, Man from La Mancha. Skip it. All right, I got a correction. I make corrections, I'm live, right? Even with Levitard, if I make mistakes, I wanna own up to them. I wanna be that guy, that person for you. I was gonna say that guy, I am a guy. I wanna be that guy for you where I take responsibility when I get things wrong. I don't like that people don't revisit when they're wrong because they think you don't care or that you didn't realize. 
Well, whether you realized or not, the funny scene with Paul Rudd and Seth Rogen and Leslie Mann where they're trying to catch him cheating and instead they catch him doing a fantasy baseball draft. I thought it was from This Is 40. I said that on the Lebitard show yesterday and I was told by Chris Cody it's knocked up. I said, no, I'm wrong. Thank you, coach. I appreciate you reaching out. It was definitely from Knocked Up. One of the great scenes. There was a TikTok, Coca. I never noticed this, and I've seen Knocked Up a dozen times, maybe more. They did a, a up-close shot of the draft board, and they had such great detail. Judd Aptow, I'm complimenting you. It was an actual fantasy draft, and they had names of actual MLB players written on the whiteboard where they were doing the fantasy draft. Ichiro's name, I wish I'd known that. I would have spoken to Ichiro about it. I would have tried to take a picture and had him sign it or something, but pretty cool. All right. Let's talk about retaliation. Retaliation is illegal when someone comes to you with an HR issue and you then fire that person. That's no bueno. Don't do that. Retaliation, when we talk about proportional response, sort of the values of proportional response, how you gauge proportional response, that is what being a president of a team is about. You get people coming to you with arguments with two different sides. You've got to choose a side and you've got to make it okay for both sides to move forward. When you have a PR issue, you've got to figure out how to respond to it, when to respond to it. That's really sort of the genesis of nothing personal and all of the mistakes that people make when they're doing PR or when they're not doing PR and they should be. Retaliation is also used when you are deciding who to sign. When we were looking at players to sign, there was no collusion. Let me be clear. Like Barry Bonds has always alleged that no one signed him because of collusion. Andre Dawson always assumed there was collusion. Nobody signed these players. Major League Baseball actually paid a ton of money to settle an allegation of collusion many, many, many years ago when certain players weren't being signed. I cannot speak to what happened before I was in baseball, nor would I. When I'm in baseball, I can certainly tell you that I was never told do not sign this player because everyone's too smart in the post-collusion settlement world to say that. But it was pretty clear when there was a hands-off policy. You can tell when there's a player who should be on a roster and is not on a roster, you can tell why. There are myriad reasons that this can happen. Performance, the juice not being worth the squeeze, and lastly, delusion, meaning the player believes that he should be paid more money than any team believes the player should be paid and doesn't want to play for less. I call that the Latrell Sprewell. I got to feed my kids on why he turned down, what was it, $10 million or something? Then there was another player who said, I don't get out of bed for under $5 million. All right, no problem. We value you at $2 million. Don't get out of bed then, no problem. I said lastly, that was incorrect. The last one is retaliation. Retaliation is when a player does something and you wanna make sure that player understands that you do not want that player doing that anymore and that you are not gonna let that player do what that player does best, be in a major league uniform or a professional football uniform. You are gonna punish him for what he's done. J.C. Treader is a player, he's an offensive lineman, also president of the NFL Players Association, and he's unsigned. And he alleged yesterday and believes that he is unsigned not because of his knees, but because of his position with the NFL Players Association. He claims that his salary requirements were not exorbitant. He claims that he was willing to sign for less than what he thinks he's worth. All players think they're worth more than they're worth, but let's just pretend that it was not exorbitant. He said not one team this offseason asked him about his injury from last year. He did not take one physical, one MRI, 
Nobody asked whether he was healthy. He didn't get a nibble. Now there's injuries happening left and right to offensive linemen around football. And guess what? Not a nibble. He's claiming, and he quoted, this is a quote, there are teams right now that I would say are desperate for a center based off how camp's going. Still no calls. Is it possible that all 32 NFL teams were told by Roger Goodell, by the way, this guy is nothing but a pain in our ass. Do not let him play. Do you know you don't have to be an active player to be the president of the NFLPA? Do you know he's still going to be the president of the NFLPA? And if you're trying to retaliate because he's representing the union or because he doesn't agree or want to do everything that you want him to do by not signing him, you're not stopping the thing that he does the most. You're actually giving him more time to do it. It makes no sense. It's like Andrew Miller not getting a deal after leading the negotiation with the players in Major League Baseball, claiming retaliation. That was just lack of performance and his desire to not play. That's not the case with J.C. Treader. I do not believe and will not accuse the NFL of colluding to make sure he doesn't play. But I do know that owners pay attention to those things. They know which players are at the table. In some sports, they don't care, like baseball, right? Steve Cohn doesn't care that Max Scherzer was so outspoken during the negotiations. He just wants to win a World Series. There are some owners who are very anti-union lawyer uh, owners who will have in their head, listen, I don't want that sort of disturber, that sort of union sympathizer around the clubhouse. I shudder to think the power he will have in the clubhouse and the impact he could have on the rest of our players. Those conversations have happened. I've had them. I'd rather win. If there's an NFL team not signing J.C. Treader for the sole reason that he was the president and is the president of the NFL PA, I would be shocked. But the evidence certainly looks that way, doesn't it? Nothing. Personal pick of the day. Yes. We won yesterday. Were you worried with the Orioles' White Sox? The Orioles walked him off. Remember, we I, I was on uh, CBS HQ last night doing picks. Went 5-0, and oh, by the way. Thank you. And I said the Orioles were one of my picks over the White Sox. A, because I didn't think Lance Lynn would pitch well, which he did. And B, I said, when you've got a team like the Orioles, when they're in the race this late and they're young and dumb and full of excitement, you start to believe that you can actually play in October when no one thought you could, and you start to win close games. The Orioles walked off when they got a bottom of the ninth tying home run, a guy like a rookie. I think it was his first home run. And then they walked it off in the 11th. The Orioles are beginning to think they can do this. So we're 91 and 73. All right, write it down. We're 18 games over. I'm giving you three games for the weekend. One, the Dodgers are in Miami right now. There's no South Beach Fool. There's no nothing. There's Tyler Anderson against a team that cannot hit. Hard stop. Dodgers over the Marlins. Saturday, fascinating game. I keep believing in my team to win the World Series, to get to the World Series, not win it, to get to the World Series. The Toronto Blue Jays, I continue to believe in them. I believe in you, Alex Manoa, even though this is your first start since calling out the Yankees and telling Garrett Cole to meet you by the Audi sign. And you're pitching against Shohei Otani, the one bright spot. Mike Trout's back hitting home runs. It's all about the Angels now. Not Blue Jays over the Angels on Saturday. Manoa over Otani. And then Sunday's an interesting game. I want to spend a few minutes on this, Coca. The Philadelphia Phillies, the aforementioned Philadelphia Phillies, Avec Bryce Harper, sans Zach Wheeler, have Thor going for them. Thor's had a good season, Noah Syndergaard. There's something that happens when your best pitcher gets hurt, and we have talked about this. It happens inside the clubhouse. It happens inside the bullpen. There is this feeling for a team that's competing for a playoff spot. When a team's out of the race and your best pitcher gets hurt, nothing changes. The players don't care. They're playing for the back of their card. They're playing for arbitration. They're playing for free agency. They're not playing for the team. They don't care. When you are in the race and your best pitcher gets hurt, the second best pitcher says, I've got you. I am going to be the ace. 
You've got Nola saying it, and you've got Syndergaard saying it. Noah Syndergaard has the stuff, and boy, does he have the opponent. Everybody wonders why Bob Nutting is not selling the Pittsburgh Pirates. The Pirates who continue to rebuild, continue. I think they've, they've lost so far this year 196 games, which is a lot. I think that may be the record for lost games in a season by a baseball team. There are people who are calling for Bob Nutting, the owner, to sell. He's not going to sell. There are a bunch of other teams for sale, not his. Wondering why the players are so bad, why there's no incremental progress, wondering how long the rebuild will be. Those are very, very good questions, but they have nothing to do with Sunday's game. Syndergaard and the Phillies over the worst team in baseball, Pittsburgh Pirates. So three picks, write them. Dodgers, Blue Jays, Phillies, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. All right, I got an update for you. We did a show yesterday where we talked about Chet Holmgren and that he was going to have his foot looked at. Guess what? He's out for the year. I don't even know what to say. They can't do anything about it. Chet Holmgren was playing in a, that pickup game with LeBron James. Remember we talked about it yesterday? Someone tweeted at me. It was a non-contact injury. Do you know how much I care whether or not an injury is contact or non-contact? That was a dirty play. Wow, I I can't believe that he tripped over his own feet. He's hurt. He can't play. Remember, executives are consequentialists. Oh, my God, you're an idiot, but can you play? Great. Don't care what you did. Oh, my God, you're the smartest guy in the world. Can you play? No. Oh, my God, you're an idiot. I would be so angry if I were the Oklahoma City Thunder that he was playing in a sanctioned event and he's out for the season. Why does the NBA sanction these off-season games? Some but not others. Hmm. Why would they sanction an event where LeBron is? I can't even imagine why that would be. Seven-footers are so fragile. Thin seven-footers. When are teams going to learn? So fragile. This is going to impact his entire career. This is the difference. This is Sam Bowie. Does any, do you know what that reference is, Coca? The Sam Bowie reference at all? I can't hear you. It's Friday. I know we only have a minute left, so are you gone already? Sam Bowie was a player that was drafted in front of Jordan. No, nothing. He was drafted by the Portland Trailblazers. Okay. That's what the Oklahoma City Thunder are going to be thinking now forever. Did we draft the wrong guy? That's the update. You won't even see Chet. You're not going to remember Chet. He's done. All right. That's the show. I I don't want to mention, I mean, just a quick mention. Do you want me to mention it? Just that Novak is not going to play in the U.S. Open? Nah, we'll talk about it all. Ben's, what? So what? Okay. Extend the show right now. You didn't talk to me about this pre-show. All right, I'll say it. I will. Okay. Okay. Ben Simmons, Joel Embiid, and Blake Griffin all missed their initial NBA season and all turned into stars. Okay, do I have to say more? Like, is that is that enough? Like, what does that have to do with anything? Oh, yes, I did call him Sam Boy. Okay, I'm going to try to, uh, sorry. Uh, okay, very good. All right, you can, you can, don't wash it out, but just we'll do a clean in. Here we go. Four six nine. I am rooting very hard for Chet Holmgren to not be Sam Bowie. I am hopeful that he will miss only this season and come back and be a productive NBA player and show the Oklahoma City Thunder that they made the right decision. I am hopeful that he will be more like Joel Embiid and Blake Griffin and Ben Simmons, all of whom missed a season and came back to be superstars. Good luck, Chet. We're rooting for you. It's just business. Have a good weekend, Coca. It's nothing personal.